Today is the day, right? Jesus came into Jerusalem at the start of Holy Week, and they acknowledged him as, as king as he came into the city by throwing down the palms and their cloaks on the road. Isn't that beautiful, just looking at that this morning? So you all should have received a palm as you came in this morning. Uh, Jesus was so pleased with what they did that day, even though there may have been misunderstanding about what was going on, Jesus said, if these keep quiet, the very stones would cry out. So we want to worship that Lord, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We don't want the stones to have to start singing. So we want to worship him uh, with, with all the accolades that belong to him. Let's worship. Crown me the many crowns, the Lamb upon His throne. I got the heavy and the crown of music by song. Awake my soul and sing, of Him who died for me. this place, Lord. We welcome you here, Lord. We want to receive from you, Lord. We want to praise you. We want to worship your name, Lord. Come and fill us as we praise your name. We 
Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his path. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name together for the lord is good and his love endures forever his faithfulness continues through all generations hallelujah amen We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prisons, Lord, he pardoned the raging seas, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise and joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is sure in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. 
Just look around and say you are well. And let the Holy Spirit fill your heart with joy. Online, just pray to Jesus this morning. Amen.
We give you full authority and full majesty, Lord. You are the Lord. Just so blessed to be in God's house this morning uh, uh, and to welcome back the Crespo family. Would you guys stand? Come on. All the way from the Brazilian embassy or whatever it is in Ohio. <laughs> We're glad you're here. And the kids. It's a great thing. Uh, several really important announcements we want to call to your attention. You, somewhere in your bulletin should be a piece of paper like this. And there's two of them. Uh, these are, uh, these are uh, different activities that are going to be going on in the life of the church this week. Um, Wednesday night, we are going to be stuffing the eggs for our Easter egg hunt, and there will be pizza. So you see this candy up here. We need about four or five times that amount of candy uh, to put into those eggs. We have a lot coming, but we need more. So please, on Wednesday when you come, bring some candy. We can uh, uh, stuff those eggs together, have a, have a great time doing that. Uh, on Holy Thursday, uh, for those of you who are on your way to work and you want a quiet encounter with God, we're going to have a communion service here between 7 and 7.30. Now, not going to be long, not going to be a lot of speaking, uh, but the presence of the Lord will be here. It's a good way just to prepare our hearts uh, for the events of everything that's going on this week. Good Friday, we have our traditional seven last words from the cross service. Seven different members of the church will be speaking for uh, five to seven minutes. And uh, I told at least one of them if they go over that, I might have a shepherd's staff to just um, pull them back uh, uh, off of that. And then, of course, uh, Easter Sunday, we have a, a breakfast at 9.30, but we have what we call a just after sunrise service uh, out in the backyard. And uh, the members from the, uh, 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 the local church that Pastor Erwin and his group are going to join us for that Sunday. We'll have a breakfast to follow. Please come. It's always a great thing to be, be outside in the chapel on Easter Sunday morning. And the reason why you got two of these is there's a business card on the back. 
And so, Eric, you can invite your son to church with you on Easter Sunday. And uh, this is for you to invite a friend to church. So important uh, that we be reaching out to people that we know uh, in the name of Jesus. Our regular small groups will not be meeting with th this week, with the exception of the group that is meeting in Vienna. We'll be meeting again at 5 o'clock and 5.30, excuse me, thank you. And uh, in your bulletin, too, there is a sign up for Easter lilies. If you would be interested in purchasing an Easter lily for your home, I think I've ordered 28 of them. So if you're interested, you can, uh, you're, I know you're not ready for this today, but you can write a check or something for the price of a lily or however many lilies you want uh, to honor someone in your life or in memory of someone. And the whole church will be filled with Easter lilies on Sunday morning. So make sure you take your allergy medication uh, <laughs> next Sunday. But that's a special thing. And um, I think I need my CE director up here to talk a little bit about the Easter egg. So come, join us, help us. We need help and need to pray for everyone that's going to come in our community this day be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just egg, but may they be transformed by the power of the Word of God. So next, next Saturday. Come so at 9 o'clock. Uh, I know there's, I think, around 130 children registered for this already. So we need helpers just to sit at tables uh, to give out registration. So come on Saturday morning. It's a great event. The most we ever had for an Easter egg hunt here was 600 one year. And it was a little crazy. So, uh, but we're not anticipating that many here because that was the first Easter egg hunt post-pandemic. But there'll probably be at least two to 300 people here on the grounds. So we'll need help, help directing people. And that will all be available uh, to you when you get here next Saturday at 9 o'clock. So uh, at this time, the children can be dismissed to children's worship. And Kelly, I'm going to ask if you would assist with our offering this morning. And as we do that, uh, we're going to sing a song in Spanish. The song is Alabaré. Uh, some of you, I think you know that song. Yes, I'm sure. So uh, this song in Spanish is uh, about all the, the tribes, language, nations, and people gathered around the th throne praising God uh, that day when we're all in heaven together. So let's stand as we sing Alabaré. Alabaré, 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 alabaré a mi Señor. Alabaré, 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 alabaré a mi Señor. Oh, al pie de su pueblo, de los redimidos, todos alababan al Señor. Unos cantaban mientras otros oraban, pero todos Alabaré, 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 alabaré
Amen. Happy Palm Sunday. Did you see my shirt? <laughs> right, let's welcome my kids. We're going to sing a, a Palm Sunday song for you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna is the highest. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna, this is Jesus. Blessed is Let's pray. Gracious God, the author of salvation, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came in in your name. Thank you that Jesus came humbly proclaiming peace. And we pray for peace in this time, in your times. Bless us, Lord, in this holy week. We give us the grace to know your love and presence more intimately. We thank you for so many blessings in your lives, for your love, for your peace, and for the hope we have in your grace. Hear, God, our prayers. And for the places in your lives where we struggle, and receive your thanks for your presence in your days. We lift it up for you, God, all those who seek direction of your Holy Spirit to circumstances in their lives. We ask in the, for wisdom. We ask in for discernment to make decisions, to use the right word when we talk to each other. We ask the Lord to strengthen those who have felt alone in without hope. Use our lives to help and encourage these people, God. Father, we know that our people who are suffering for hard situations can be in their work or in the lack of health for difficult relationships, for families who are waiting for a miracle, either of healing and their physicals, uh, physical bodies or restorations in, of their souls, parents who need wisdom raising their children. Oh God, we pray for your guidance, guidance for your Holy Spirit. We need you, God, help parents to continue steadfastly in prayer. Even when it seems life is getting more complicated, God, strengthen their faith and take away Satan's lies from them. Lord, we pray for encouragement and strength for the foster parents within our community. And give you the understanding, patience, and grace as they open their homes and families to children in need. 
Thank you for so much for them, God. I pray for the children and the youth. Reveal Jesus to their hearts. May they know you, loving you, seeking you, serving you, honor you, and delight in you all the days of their lives. Keep away, God, enemies, traps, and lies against their lives. Protect them and guide them through your Holy Spirit, God. Father, our children need to not only hear and see you, but to understand you. Open their understanding when they hear and read your word. I pray for their minds to be aware about the spiritual things, God. I pray for all members who are suffering some kind of physical pain, bringing pain relief and healing to in their stomach pain, headache, migraine, back pain, and people who are in difficulty sleeping, who know, God, we know, God, that, that in your presence there is healing. And we ask in the Lord to touch these people, especially this morning, in a special request. I ask him for the Lord to touch our brother Bill. I thank you for all your grace and mercy and pour over Bill's life. And I ask in you, in the name of Jesus, that you continue to heal and fulfill your purpose in his life, God. I pray for our church and the events that will be happening to bless our community. May the Lord use the egg hunt that we're going to have next week to bless our children and families who will come. May they see your glory. May they know the kids know Jesus through his story that Mary is organizing with declaring. Oh, God, bless those leaders uh, in your church and uh, work in the lives of the children and families that are going to come here. Protect the children, bring their joy and peace for their lives. Thank you, God, for the life of the Crespo's family who are here these days. Thank you, your very much for their lives and for what they have done in this church. Keep it direct in their lives in Ohio and may they hear your voice in all areas. I pray for the guidance for your Holy Spirit over them and Julie and be a God. Lord, enter our lives, in your lives, our church, enter in our city, enter in our country once again today. Heal us, Lord, transform us renew us, draw us close to you in this journey with, of the Holy Week. Empower us with his strength and courage and uh, with the assurance that uh, you are with us. We pray for Pastor Doug, and uh, he is bringing the message today. He's bringing now your message. We pray for your divine anointing on him and on us as we listen, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's always a challenge on, on Sundays like this, right? It's the same themes every year, like Palm Sunday, Easter, right? It's, it's the same story, and it's worth hearing every year. I called a pastor friend of mine, and I said, I actually called Rich up in Silver Spring, and I said, Rich, And so later in the day, I got a message back from him, and he said, that's okay. He said, last year I preached a message, and the message was my best thoughts from Palm Sunday from seven years ago. So uh, I am not going to do that this morning, uh, but I am going to start with another story. Um, I heard a, a story recently about a Catholic priest uh, who was using a cordless mic in church for the very first time, and as he stood in the pulpit, he began what was supposed to be a responsive reading like we, we did from Psalm 100. And since it was his first time using the mic, he wanted to make sure it was on, so he tapped the side of the microphone and said, testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, to which the congregation replied like good Roman Catholics and also with you. So, right, sometimes, Lord, would you give us fresh eyes as we look uh, into your word this morning, helps to see things we've never seen before, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So, sometimes we can become so familiar with things, we stop paying attention to what's going on around us. How many of you have ever driven home from work after a tough day and forgot how you got there? Right? So, it's not just an age thing, I feel better. So, uh, we say things uh, to ourselves like, 
I know this route so well, I could drive it with my eyes closed. And uh, we say that until something unexpected happens and we find ourselves in the middle of an accident. So again, it's my prayer this morning that we wouldn't find ourselves asleep at the wheel when it comes to the story of Palm Sunday, that God would wake us up and that God would help us to approach this story with fresh eyes. Amen? We need fresh eyes. So find the Bible, get ready, open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. We're going to start our reading at verse 20, 28, Luke 19, 28. Um, what we are about to read from the Gospel of Luke is, is so familiar to us. Not only is this story familiar to us, but the road that the disciples and Jesus were traveling on that first Palm Sunday was very familiar to them. They knew this road. The disciples and Jesus could have traveled this road with their eyes closed. It was a road that they had traveled before Why they would make their, their yearly pilgrimages uh, into Jerusalem uh, on this occasion for the Passover. They would know when they reached the town of Bethany, a very familiar place to Jesus and his disciples. It was the last stop on the way into Jerusalem. They would be approaching that familiar turn in the road as they left Bethany and as they started to go up to Jerusalem, climbing up to the Mount of Olives. And they would reach the peak of, of the Mount of Olives in this beautiful vista of the city right? Shining in the sunlight would there be there before them. I had the privilege a few years ago of being on that same road and witnessing that same sight. It was just breathtaking and amazing as the city uh, pours out in front of you. And Jesus knew that road uh, just as well as the disciples. Uh, he would have known it from the time he was a small boy along with Mary and Joseph and his brothers and sisters as they would travel on their way into that city to celebrate the Passover for the previ and for the previous three years, think about it, in Jesus' ministry, every year, he would travel that road with his disciples into the city. As Jesus approached the city, they would remember how King David had first conquered that city for God and how Solomon, David's son, had built the first great temple was, that was there, and, and then how that temple was destroyed and left in room, ruins by the Babylonians until a great leader by the name of Nehemiah came along and rebuilt the walls of that city. They would remember all those stories. Jesus and his disciples were extremely familiar. It's on, but it's not working like it should. So... Tap, tap, tap. One, two, three, test. So, <laughs> Bob, perfect. Uh, they were familiar with this story. But on this day, I'll just, Al, I'll just talk louder. I can do that. So, but on this day, they would get to experience this trip into Jerusalem in a completely new way because God would show up. And my prayer this morning is, as we listen to God's word, is it's that he would show up. So we're going to read what happened, all that by way of background, Luke chapter 19, 28. After Jesus had said this, he had just finished teaching a, a, a parable. He went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, and as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt that no one has ever ridden upon. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them that the Lord needs it. And then he sent uh, ahead, and, and they found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying my colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on the ground, just like in front of us this morning. They threw their cloaks on the colt and on the ground, and they put Jesus on it. And as they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when they came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, 
rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the very stones would cry out. And as they approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would have brought you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls, and they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So usually, when I preach a passage of scripture, right, I like to start at the beginning of that passage and work my way through to the end. Isn't that logical to do that? But today, I want to work from the end, and then we're going to go back to the beginning, and then we're going to circle back to us in this room today. So let's first go back to the end of the story. There's a parade going on. I wish I had balloons this morning. It would have been perfect. There's a parade. People are celebrating. They're singing Hosanna, right, which means Lord save us. They're crying out to Jesus. It would seem like at this point in, in Jesus' ministry, this would be the high point, that there would be, it would be his greatest triumph, that he would be happy. Yet it's here, right at the end of this story, that Jesus stops the parade and he begins to weep. And as he looks over that beautiful view of the city, he, he, he sheds these tears because he knew what was going to happen in the future. Our text tells us what he, when, he, when he cried these tears, it wasn't for himself. The tears he shed were not for himself at, at, at this point. We might be tempted to think that that was the case. It wasn't because of the betrayals that would soon happen from Peter and his closest friend. It wasn't because of the crown of thorns at the end of that week that would be pressed into his head. It wasn't because of the nails that would soon be driven through his hands and his feet. That's not the reason why he was crying as he looked out over the city. Maybe that you might be able to make the case that that's why he was crying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I think that was part of it, but even that was so much more. But that's not the reason he weeps at the end of this story. On this Palm Sunday, he weeps for them. He weeps for the people in the city. And he weeps for us. He says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. When, when we and other people, when we come to church and we sing hosannas, and they were, as they were singing the hosannas as Jesus entered that, that city, uh, Jesus didn't just hear the hosannas, but behind the hosannas, he heard the screams that would come from that city in 70 AD when their beautiful temple that he was looking at would be destroyed right, by a great cataclysm. Jesus was looking into the future and he was, gonna see, he was seeing what was happening just a few decades ahead for them. And he says, the days are going to come when upon, upon you, when your enemies will build an embankment against you, old Jerusalem, and they will encircle you on every side, and they will dash your children to the ground, and they're not going to leave one stone standing upon another. That literally happened in the year 70 AD. In a fit of rage, right, the Roman soldiers were commanded not to destroy the city before they went into Jerusalem. But in a fit of rage, they were so worked up by the rebelliousness of the people that they sacked the city. Not one stone left on another for the temple. Just like Jesus said would happen. Jesus sees that. And he weeps. It breaks his heart. The motivation behind that weeping, you need to understand, was the great love he had for the people in that city. The great love. Palm Sunday is the beginning 
I want you to think of it as the love story of Holy Week. It's like a divine love story. It's what motivates Jesus to weep at this point in the story. It's what motivates him to come to Jerusalem in the first place. Jesus didn't come to Jerusalem for the parade. You need to know that. Jesus didn't come because he needed public accolades, right? Scripture tells us before he came to earth, he had all the accolades that heaven could offer him. He didn't become, become because he needed that. Jesus came to Jerusalem because he was motivated by love. The timing of his coming wasn't an accident either. One of the things that stood out to me in the last few weeks as I've read over the Easter accounts and what happened on Holy Week is nothing happened by accident. Jesus was in charge of all of it. But in this case, the time of his coming was no accident. It was Passover. Passover was the yearly celebration which commemorated the freeing of the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt. Many of you know that story. The night when Jewish families would come together and rejoice in groups of at least 10. And, and an innocent lamb without blemish would be offered as a sacrifice in the temple to commemorate this event. But Jesus knew it was never about the lambs at Passover. Those lambs were the picture of himself. They, they were a picture of another lamb who would come without spot, without blemish, sinless, and would willingly give his life for our sin. Just five days later in the story on Good Friday, to free us from a greater bondage than slavery in Egypt, but to free us from slavery and to sin and death and to offer to the whole world the opportunity for forgiveness. You got to understand, uh, uh, historians, shortly after this, uh, the Roman historian Josephus said that um, in, in one Passover, shortly after the time of Christ, that there were somewhere like 25,000 lambs that would be sacrificed. Jewish law prescribed that you couldn't slaughter a lamb unless there were at least 10 people present to eat it. So there were, uh, you know, over two and a half million people in Jerusalem gathered that day. All these rams uh, being sacrificed. And at this very moment on Good Friday when Jesus would be hanging on the cross, historians say that rivers of blood would have been flowing from the temple, from all the lambs that would be slaughtered in the temple on that day. And so there's a song we sing sometime in church, the hymn writers sing it, that there is a fountain today that is filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners who are plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That river still flows. Why is that important? We all need forgiveness. We need forgiveness from our sins. We need to be set free. Scripture says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Palm Sunday ultimately is, is about the story of that love. It's about a love that takes action it's about a love that is fearless. You've got to understand Jesus was fearless going into the city that day. It's about a love that turns Simon into Peter's and Saul's into Paul's. It's about a love that has the power to change us from the inside out. It's about a love that continues to love even when it has been rejected, even when the hosannas turn into shouts of crucify him. It's a love that doesn't stop. Max Lucado writes about that. Max Lucado says this. He says, forget any suggestion that Jesus was trapped during Holy Week. 
Erase any theory that Jesus made a miscalculation. Miscalcula Ignore any speculation that the cross was a last ditch, it, ditch effort to rescue a dying mission. For if these words of Jesus tell us anything, they tell us that Jesus died on purpose. No accident. No surprise. No hesitation. No faltering. The journey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Lucato says, didn't begin in Jericho. It didn't begin in Galilee. It didn't even begin in Bethlehem. The journey to the cross began long before that. It, bo it began the first time Adam and Eve disobeyed God's one command. And the crunching of that forbidden fruit still echoes down to today. It was there in the garden, not the Garden of Gethsemane, but the Garden of Eden, that Jesus begins the long walk to Calvary. So we're here this morning in an attempt to see this story with new eyes. Remember, I began my message today wanting to start from the end to go back to the beginning and circle around back to us. So now we're at the beginning part, but don't worry, you are going to get to eat lunch today. <laughs> Remember how the story starts. Go into a village, enter it, you will see a colt tied there, which no one has ever written. When you see the colt, Jesus says, hot wire the colt. No, he doesn't say hot wire the colt. But he says, if anybody's asking you why you're taking this, this colt, this donkey, just say the Lord needs it, and he's going to give it to you. Some people, when they read that account of the story, and I've been guilty of this in the past, they try to over-spiritualize it. But that's not what's going on here. Jesus had friends in Bethany, right? Mary and Martha, two of his closest friends, lived in the city of Bethany. When Jesus would go to visit ministry, uh, visit the city of Jerusalem throughout his ministry, the home he would go to would relax, would be the home of Mary and Martha. Just prior to this event, when Jesus goes into the city, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Big deal. People knew this wasn't normal stuff. Everybody in the city of Bethany would know who Jesus was, so we can assume that the owner of this donkey knew that if Jesus comes and asks to borrow your, your donkey, you're going to give it up to him. So here's the point of that story. Jesus was in control. Jesus had a plan, even before he went into the city. Which brings me back to circling around back to us. Because if all we have is a story with a beginning and an end, and if it doesn't get back to us, what's the point of the story, right? You know, one, uh, th this is the main point of what I'm going to say today. One of the things, you know, there's a temptation when you preach on Easter or when you preach on Palm Sunday to try to harmonize the story to my, uh, try to make them all fit together into one neat little package. But that is not the way the Gospels were written, right? Luke had a point as to why he was telling this story this way, and that's what I want us to focus on this morning. Remember, he comes to the end of the story. Remember when Jesus weeps over J Jerusalem, he weeps because he sees the destruction that's coming. He knows what's going to happen in 70 A.D. And he gives a reason for that destruction in verse 44. It's the whole purpose of this story being retold by Luke in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus says this happens because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's the point of the story. It's different than, than Mark. It's different than Matthew. It's different than what John says. Uh, he's, this is the point of the story. God is here this morning. That's what I want to emphasize for those of us in this room. He is here. 
not only with his omnipresence. You know what that means? God is everywhere, right? God is here this morning. God is in the bar down the street. God is home with somebody when they're still in bed and they didn't come up to come to church on Sunday. God is there. He is omnipresent. But my prayer is, is that his, his manifest, his living presence would be revealed to us in this room this morning. I believe God is here on this Palm Sunday to confirm some things in you and to change lives. That's why I believe we're here. I don't know what you've been through. I was, I was going over the message this morning and I just felt this strong urge in my spirit that I needed to emphasize this. For maybe many of us or all of us or some of us or even just one of us, God wants to assure you that he loves you. He has always loved you. He wants you to know that you haven't been forgotten. Whatever you've been through, through the hard times, through the difficult times, through things maybe you've never talked about before in your life, God has not forgotten you. And you are not so far gone that God cannot impact you. And even in that time, when whatever was happening in your life, when things were out of control, God wants to assure you because you're here today that he had a plan. He had a plan. He had a plan on, plan on that first Palm Sunday. Those things that happened to you, which maybe were horrible, that God never would have wanted to happen, that he never really intended to happen, that God was aware of those things, those things even that seemed like a coincidence, were not really a coincidence at all. God had a plan. You're here this morning. And even if you can't see where it's going to lead, and as you're here on this Palm Sunday, God wants to invite you back into the plan. He wants you back in the plan. Worship team, you can come on up. He wants to invite you back into the plan. Russell, if you could just play softly for a little bit. If you doubt that God had a plan, Remember Palm Sunday, right? Remember all the events of Easter week and how everything unfolded. Nothing that you've gone through in your life caught God by surprise. But God had a plan to redeem it, to buy it back for something useful and beautiful. God loves you. He weeps over the bad things that have happened to you just like he weeped over the city of Jerusalem. And it's not like he wasn't active, right? He was active. But he weeps. Then I just want you to remember Calvary. Right? If Palm Sunday isn't enough. Remember that somebody loved you enough, even though your father and mother may have forsaken you. Remember somebody loved you enough to give his life for you. And if that's not enough, remember Easter, right? Resurrection happens. Changes of life happen. And God can breathe life into you. So what I want us to do, we're not going to do an altar call this morning. But uh, it, it, uh, one of the ways that uh, people in the Old Testament would pray is they would pray with their hands open in front of them like this. And if you're comfortable doing that, I want you to think of whatever that thing is in your life. You can do that now. Whatever that thing is that you need to offer up to him. I want you to present that to him this morning. And let the healing continue to flow. 
maybe for the first time, to, to allow the healing to begin to flow. Just receive that from the Father this morning. God is here. Father, we lift those things to you, whatever they are. Lord, we thank you for this story, the story of, of Palm Sunday and how you wept over the city. And Lord, that same compassion you showed for the city of Jerusalem, you have for us this morning over every person in this room, over us as individuals. We want to reopen ourselves to your plan today as we close this service. And Holy Spirit, do whatever you want. Holy Spirit, do whatever you want. Holy Spirit, you are Heavenly Father, come into our life, our lives. Fill them with your spirit, with your presence. Lord, we, we do not want to miss the time of your coming to us this morning. And we are here, Lord. We, we receive you into our life. Maybe for the first time. Maybe it's a renewal this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done to us, for us. Let's stand.
As you go forth from this place this morning, go with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Receive what's next for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.